thank you all very much for coming. I'll let Tony get started. This is Dr. Tony Brock, Anthony Broccoli from Rutgers University, and he's going to talk this morning about climate change. And gee, I can't imagine why it's an interesting topic. <laughs> start with the hurricane and the storm, and then move on to the October snowstorm, and then no snowstorms during the winter, You're and then no like rain. Let's <laughs> 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 But, um, you know, especially how it affects us here uh, slightly more locally. I, I know we hear more often about coastal impacts, um, but hopefully we'll hear a little bit about the rest of the world. So without further ado, uh, thank you very much. Yep, yep, so, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming out this morning. Uh, it's nice to see you all so, so early in the day. I, I mentioned to Sally before that normally I teach on Tuesdays and Friday mornings this semester, but I share the teaching with one of my colleagues. And so while I am actually almost down to the minute, while I am talking with you this morning, he is handing out the second exam of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the best part of it is, since he's just finished the part of the course that he teaches, and that's what the exam is going to be covering, I don't have to grade the exam. He has to grade the exam. So uh, I am much happier being here than I would be being there, looking at those unhappy faces in the classroom as I hand out the exams. And hopefully I won't see too many unhappy faces here this morning. So I titled my talk with a little bit of a tongue in cheek, Weather Gone Wild is Climate Change to Blame. is that this is a question that I get asked all the time. And it's a very tricky question to answer because, uh, well, the best way to describe it might be to use an analogy. You've probably heard that there are some baseball players that are suspected of having used performance enhancing drugs, right? So if one of those players was playing a game and you happen to be sitting in the stands and he hit a home run, if somebody asked you, was that home run caused by performance enhancing drugs, would be a tough question to answer. You could say, of course, you know, they made him stronger. But he probably hit home runs when he was in high school, too. Or you could say, well, of course not. It, it was because the pitcher threw up a meatball and it was easy for him to hit. But that's not quite the right answer either. And so too with climate change, because we're talking about a phenomenon that does influence the chances of certain events happening. But those events may have happened anyway. So I'll try to explain as we go further into the talk today what types of extreme weather may be plausibly associated with climate change and also what types may not. But I'm going to do this in the context of what's been going on here in New Jersey over the last year, a little bit more than a year. So I'm going to start out with some climate observations from New Jersey. These are courtesy of Dave Robinson, who is our New Jersey State climatologist. Uh, when there's interesting weather going on, even if I don't see Dave in person, I feel like he's right there with me because he's always being quoted on uh, the radio or in the newspapers. In fact, as I was driving up 287 this morning, there was a little bit about him talking about the dry conditions that are unfolding in New Jersey, which I'll say something about in a minute. But first, I want to start out talking about temperatures. And this bar chart over here, you may not be able to read all of the lettering, but the bar chart shows the monthly average temperatures for New Jersey for the last 12 months. And they're shown relative to normal. So this is the zero line. This is the baseline. Above normal months are shown in red. Below normal months are, are not there at all because there <laughs> haven't been any. The last 12 months in New Jersey have all been above normal in terms of temperature. 
Uh, I'm just going to, since I can read the writing, starting in 2011, we had the seventh warmest April, followed by the ninth warmest May, the seventh warmest June, the second warmest July, fifth warmest September, sixth warmest November, fourth warmest December, third warmest February, and the warmest March on record. So we have had an extraordinary run of above normal temperatures here in New Jersey. Now we were talking a little bit before uh, the talk started that what has made this very interesting for its effects on our environment is that we've had this record warm March following a winter that as a whole was the fourth warmest winter on record. That means the soil at the end of the winter started out a lot warmer than it would normally be. So that the impact of this very warm March was to get a lot of our uh, vegetation going much sooner than normal. In fact, my little uh, meteorological factoid, at the weather station in New Brunswick, we measure the soil temperature four inches down every day in addition to measuring the air temperature. <coughs> On March 25th, the soil temperature in New Brunswick was about the same this year as it was last year on April 25th. So everything was about a month ahead of schedule, not just because March was warm, but because of the cumulative effects of a warm winter in which the ground really didn't freeze except maybe just the upper layer for a day or two. Um, we had very few days this winter that had below freezing temperatures all day, maximum temperatures below freezing uh, compared to most years. We had very little snow, so there, even though snow can be an insulator that keeps the ground warm if it's persistent throughout the winter, it also takes energy to melt the snow. This year, that energy could instead raise the temperature of the soil. So we've come through a very unusual period and uh, capped off by, by a very warm March. Now, April so far hasn't been as warm as March. But if you think the early part of April has been cool, you've been fooled by how warm March was. Because so far, and today is the 10th of April, so far we're averaging between two and three degrees above normal for April also. Yeah, even though it doesn't seem that warm. Now, of course, two to three degrees would mean the bar would only be up around here. So uh, compared to the last five months, that would be uh, a relatively small uh, above normal temperature, but uh, of course we still have two-thirds of the month to go and by the weekend I think it will be probably uh, touching 70 again, so we'll, we'll be a little bit farther above normal. We've also had extremes in precipitation over the last year, and that is in fact an understatement. This chart uh, can fool you because it's been scaled so that we can see what happened in August. August was the wettest of any month on record in New Jersey. It was 13 inches above normal or above average. Uh, Dave Robinson uh, <coughs> told me that before Irene arrived, we were already an eyelash below being the wettest August on record. And then Irene came on top of it. So that's how we smashed the record. But even though we did have a wet, very wet August and a wet September, the earlier part, late spring and summer, was dry last year as well. So we've had unusual extremes. Uh, sometime around the end of July, I managed to get somebody out to fix the sprinklers at my house. And as he was fixing them, the thunderstorms were building. Literally, I'm not joking. He was out there, and you know, I'm thinking, you really want to be out here with this lightning nearby? He says, ah, I do this all the time. He finished it, they started working, and literally, I didn't turn them on again after that. So, would you call them out again? Yeah, I was just uh, yeah, I, might, I might have to. Because of these three months, which you see here, 
uh, the 8th driest February followed by the 10th driest March. And cumulatively, when you look at the three months, January, February, and March, it's been quite dry during a time of year when we very often depend on uh, precipitation, both in the form of rain and snow, to recharge groundwater and also uh, our reservoirs. I was listening uh, to the radio, as I mentioned before, on the way up, and I heard the reporter who was at one of the uh, Bergen County reservoirs saying that there's no problem, the reservoir is at 90% of capacity. Well, 90% of capacity for this time of year is actually low, because this is the time of year when generally they're filled. So uh, obviously a lot depends on what will happen in the next several months, but uh, at this point it is important to be aware that uh, we've been very dry in addition to these numbers which tell us the deficit in precipitation, they don't tell this whole story because we've also had much more evaporation than normal because the temperatures have been so high. So that combination, and then when you put on top of it in the last five days or so, we've had more than our share of wind, which is drying things out, causing a lot of fire danger. Uh, the Fresh Kills landfill is still burning this morning as our uh, uh, parts of Long Island. So uh, we are in uh, the early stages of drought. Whether or not it continues depends on what happens beyond our ability to, to forecast the weather. We know that it looks dry for about the next week or so. What happens beyond that, uh, a little bit hard to say. So we've had a lot of unusual weather and climate events in the last year plus. For 2011, these are the top 10 that uh, Dave Robinson put together. I, I, I don't think it's gotten quite the publicity of David Letterman's top 10 <laughs> list, but you can certainly see a lot of events here uh, that we remember wettest year for New Jersey, tropical storm Irene, the wettest month in August, our October snowstorm. Uh, third warmest year, calendar year 2011 was. Uh, it would have been probably the warmest year, except January and February a year ago, 2011, were colder than average months, especially January. Um, July, the second hottest month on record. July 22nd. Uh, New Brunswick reached 105 degrees. The temperature has only been higher than that one day. Um, I was monitoring it very closely as I played in uh, the annual golf outing <laughs> for the lab that I used to work before I came to Rutgers. Uh, my uh, partners were not as thrilled with me calling out the temperature every <laughs> well. Uh, but uh, I, I can attest it was a very warm day. We had a big snow at the end of January in 2011, making it the snowiest month, the snowiest January on record. And unlike this year, where March was not a very stormy month, we had some big rainstorms in March 2011, causing major flooding. Now this is 2011. If we wanted to cheat a little bit and go one week back into 2010, we also had the big post-Christmas snowstorm that I'll uh, talk a little bit about later. So this is the question. Where does this fit in to the context of climate change? Yes, we've had a lot of unusual events. Uh, I heard somebody talk about going to see the Great Falls. You won't see them looking like this. Uh, there's probably a, re a relative trickle of water going over the falls with the lack of rain we've had in the last several months. And this was, uh, this was a nor'easter. This was not uh, a storm that probably uh, people will remember unless they were directly affected by it because we've had so many unusual things uh, since that time. So let me just say a little bit about climate change here. I'm going to spend maybe 10 minutes on climate change. Uh, combustion of fossil fuels emits carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 
and currently this is about 9 billion tons of carbon per year. You'll, you'll see this expressed sometimes <coughs> as the amount of carbon, sometimes the amount of carbon dioxide. If you count carbon dioxide, then it's more like 28 billion tons. So when you think about this, of course, we don't perceive this happening because this is an odorless, colorless gas, but there's roughly 7 billion people on Earth. Each one of us, if we average it, is responsible for more than a ton of carbon being emitted per year, but this isn't something we're consciously aware of in the same way we would if we were hauling a ton of trash out to the curb every year. And of course, uh, those of us who are fortunate enough to live in the wealthy parts of the world, our share is considerably larger. Uh, roughly half of this carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere. Most of the rest goes into the ocean. It is not benign there because it raises the acidity of the ocean. But uh, I'll talk mainly about the impacts on the atmosphere. Uh, this increasing carbon dioxide heats the earth and global temperatures have risen between about a degree and a degree and a half during the past century. And those increasing temperatures also cause other changes in climate and sea level. Uh, the basic physics, how does this work? Well, the way the Earth is heated is by the visible light that the Earth receives from the sun. That light heats the surface of the Earth, and that warm surface of the Earth heats the atmosphere. As you know, as you go higher up in the atmosphere, it tends to get cooler. That's because you're moving away from the source of the heating, which is the energy that the surface of the Earth receives from the sun. The warmer an object is, the more energy it emits in the form of infrared light. And this is the Earth's cooling mechanism that balances the heating from the sun's visible light. So there, there has to be a balance in order for the temperature to remain steady. There has to be the same amount of energy coming in from the sun that there is being emitted back to space in the form of infrared light. And infrared light, this is what happens when someone comes to do a home audit at your house. They have an imaging device that detects infrared light. It shows where energy is leaking from your house. This is how search and rescue teams find people who are lost in the woods. At night, they look for the infrared light that's being given off by their bodies. So this is just basic physics that we're all familiar with. Carbon dioxide and water vapor are greenhouse gases that absorb infrared light, making it more difficult for energy to escape into space. So the way carbon dioxide affects the climate is by changing the balance between the energy coming in from the sun and the energy going back out to space in the form of infrared light. <coughs> and if we didn't have any greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's a very simple exercise in physics to estimate what the average temperature of the Earth would be, and it would be around zero degrees Fahrenheit. So we know greenhouse gases warm the Earth uh, because it's basic physics and because we can calculate that without them, uh, the Earth's temperature would be much, much colder than it is right now. Carbon dioxide is going up, that 9 billion tons of carbon we put into the atmosphere every year has raised the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Here's where the earliest measurements were begun in 1957, 1958, the Mauna Loa Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, when uh, the late Dr. Charles Keeling started making these measurements. He picked a place that was in the middle of the ocean so that it was far away from tailpipes, smokestacks, etc. Uh, we now measure carbon dioxide at many other locations, and uh, the measurements are very consistent with what we see at Mauna Loa as long as we go away from local sources. In the late 1950s, we had about 315 parts per million. 
Now we're up to over 390 parts per million. And you can see that this curve is sloping upward at the end. Uh, the, it's very close to exponential growth. This is, of course, related to population growth and also economic growth. Uh, the wealthier we are, the more energy we tend to use. And so uh, carbon dioxide levels uh, are rising more rapidly now than they were 50 years ago. To put this into a longer term perspective, we don't have measurements like this that come from uh, modern scientific instruments deliberately set up for that purpose. But we can say from uh, evidence from little bubbles of air trapped in the ice in Greenland and Antarctica that prior to the Industrial Revolution, we had about 280 <coughs> parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And there uh, began a rise uh, during the 19th century, late 18th century, early 19th century. And the Mauna Loa record shows you the end of that period. OK, global temperature. Each little square in this diagram is the global temperature for a year, for a particular calendar year. So this last dot over here is 2011, 2010, <coughs> etc. The temperatures are expressed relative to a baseline. The baseline is arbitrary. Uh, for this purpose, the baseline was chosen from 1951 through 1980. So I like to think of that as kind of the baby boomer climate that uh, I experienced when I was a, a kid somewhere in here. Uh, but it doesn't really matter what baseline period you use, because what we're interested in is the shape of this curve. And what it shows is uh, rising temperatures in the early part of the 20th century, a period where they leveled off into the 1960s and then a more rapid rise since that time. Temperatures go up and down quite a bit from year to year. Things like El Nino and La Nina influence the temperatures. No better example of that than 1998, which had the lar largest El Nino of the 20th century, in all likelihood. Uh, 2008 was a La Nina year. The La Nina went away for a while. 2010 had a mild El Nino. 2011, La Nina came back. We're still in a La Nina. So my expectation is that 2012 will not challenge 2010 because the La Nina is continuing. Our next record will probably come the next time we have an El Nino. Is there a theory for why it was flat for 35 years or so? Yes, there is. Um, one, uh, probably the most common explanation for that is that there are other types of pollutants that result from burning fossil fuels. Uh, you've heard of the, the problem with acid rain and sulfur dioxide coming out of smokestacks. When you burn fossil fuels with sulfur in them, they produce sulfur dioxide gas that can form uh, little droplets they're really droplets of sulfuric acid that reflect sunlight back into space. So when the global economy started growing during World War II into the post-World War II era, there were no controls on sulfur dioxide emissions. So the concentrations of these sulfur dioxide particles built up in the atmosphere. And they were reflecting sunlight and partially offsetting the effects of carbon dioxide. But because sulfur dioxide has adverse impacts on human health, uh, the Clean Air Act was passed in the early 1970s, and similar things happened in Europe. And that allowed the sulfur dioxide to get stripped out at the site, uh, typically power plants, where most of the coal was being burned. and so. That is the reason why we think this flat period took place. It's also um, another thing that I didn't mention that can affect climate are volcanoes. Big volcanic eruptions 
also inject sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, but the big ones are even more effective because they inject it into the stratosphere where it can stay for several years. So in the 1880s, there was the big eruption of Krakatau in Indonesia, and here's the cooling that followed Krakatau. In uh, the, uh, yeah, Pinatubo is here, we'll get to Pinatubo. In uh, the early 19th century, there were a couple of other more minor eruptions, but then things got quiet for a number of years until Mount Agung erupted in the Philippines in 1963, and then look at what happened to 1964. Uh, El Chichon in Mexico in 1982, we got a drop associated with that, and here's the Pinatubo drop 1991, May 1991, is when Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines. The temperature went down, stayed low for a couple of years, and then came back up again. So there are many things that can influence global temperature. Uh, the long-term trend, when we look past some of these ups and downs that are caused by volcanoes, El Ninos, La Ninas, that's what's showing us the effect that uh, greenhouse gases have on temperature. And of course, as the Earth warms, there are other manifestations of that warming. <coughs> this is uh, sea ice in the Arctic. There was a lot of news in 2007, because in 2007, the amount of sea ice in the Arctic at the end of the summer melt season was lower than it had ever been before. In fact, it broke the old record by a substantial margin. Uh, Mid-September is when the ice is usually a minimum, because by then it's had all summer to melt. Uh, uh, you'll recall that in the Arctic, there's a lot of sunlight during the summer, then almost no sunlight during the winter. So melting doesn't just peak in <coughs> July, it keeps on going through the rest of the summer. And by mid-September, this area in white was the only part of the Arctic that was covered with ice. This purple line is the average from the 1980s and 1990s, so this was really a big reduction in sea ice. For several years since then, the ice has remained relatively low each summer, but hasn't threatened this record again until 2011, this past summer. Now you'll notice the pattern here is a little bit different. But the area is almost identical to what it was in 2007. There was just a tiny bit more ice at the minimum on September 9, 2011 than there was on September 16, 2007. In this past summer, both the Northwest Passage that the uh, 16th and 17th century explorers were looking for was open but also the Northeast Passage was open. And this is one of the reasons why the US Navy has a task force climate change <coughs> whose purpose is to try to understand the impacts that climate change is going to have on national security and on safety on the high seas, since of course our Navy is very much involved in uh, operations to rescue uh, ships that may be in trouble if we find that there's going to be more and more shipping going through this region, at least during the summer, uh, the Navy is concerned about that. They're also concerned about competition for exploiting natural resources that uh, are in the Arctic that have been beneath the ice, but now may become more uh, accessible. This is kind of a complicated chart. This shows the pattern of sea ice for each year from 1979, when our satellite measurements began, through the present. And the way it's coded, and the colors are a little hard to see, the more blue the lines are, the older they are. The more red they are, the newer they are. 
So you can certainly see here in this period of minimum ice, the blue lines are near the top of the band. The red lines are near the bottom. This darkest red line is 2011, and it just barely got edged out by 2007. But these last several years have been much lower than previous years. And this is when we really expect to see the biggest changes in ice during the summer. It's always cold in the Arctic in the winter, so the ice will grow back. Sometimes people will say, yeah, you know, the, the, there was a record low last summer, but the ice since then grew more rapidly than it ever did before. Well, of course it did, because at the end of the winter, there's always going to be complete ice cover in the Arctic. The summer is what's telling us about the changes that are happening, because the summer is the period when the ice is thinnest and most vulnerable to melting. Could you go back to that one second? What is the yellow, the yellow line? Is that That's uh, so far in 2012. And I downloaded this probably about a month ago, so it's not completely up to date. Now, to just give you an idea of what this looks like, I'm just going to have to step back here, and I will try to do this without uh, the find. There's my cursor. So this is um, an animation, which I just hit the wrong button to start. I guess working upside down isn't quite as good as I thought it would be. OK. So it will take a minute to get started. This is an animation from a climate model that's been run out into the future to try to show the effects of climate change. Uh, the warm colors are above normal for a late 20th century baseline. The blue colors are below normal. And what I want to call your attention to is the way that things change. They don't change in a smooth way where things just steadily get warmer and warmer and warmer. Instead, we see these patches coming and going. And those are the normal fluctuations in climate from one year to the next. I'll, I'll run this again a couple of times uh, so that you can see things more, more carefully. I want you to pick out a spot. It could be New Jersey. Uh, and watch what happens at that spot. So it may go from blue to white to yellow, blue, white, yellow. Here in the tropics, you see El Nino's happening every time it turns yellow here. That's an El Nino like that. So from year to year, we're trying to tease out the long-term trend. But what we're seeing are big changes from year to year. But as we get into the middle of the 21st century, we don't see the blues anymore. We don't even see the whites anymore. Now the cool years are yellow and the warm years are red. So we're still going to be seeing the normal fluctuations, warmer and colder, but the baseline just keeps getting warmer and warmer. The warming is especially large over the continents in the northern hemisphere, not as large in the southern hemisphere, and there are certain patches where the warming remains relatively small because of the circulation in the ocean. This is an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about whether or not the unusual weather we're seeing is associated with climate change. We don't expect climate change to make things warmer as if we're smoothly going up an escalator. It's much more like you're going on a hiking trail to the top of a peak, but that path has ups and downs as you try to get there. So we have to be very careful when we talk about weather that we're not losing sight of what the long-term uh, picture is. <clears throat> so uh, what is the effect of climate change on extreme events, extreme weather events? Uh, a report has just been put out re very recently by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a collection of the world's climate scientists, and they have been focusing specifically on these extreme events. So I'm going to talk about some of the extreme events we've had in New Jersey, and then 
share with you what the science says about whether or not those events are or are not associated with climate change. So last summer, uh, drought and wildfires in the southern part of the country. Each one of these red dots in this NOAA image represents the location of a wildfire. So southeastern part of the United States, Gulf Coast states, across into the lower Great Plains, Texas, New Mexico, lots of fires this past summer associated with uh, very dry conditions there. Uh, these are precipitation statistics for the country for last summer, June through August. Texas had its driest summer on record in 117 years. That's what number one means, the driest year. New Mexico, second driest. Oklahoma, third driest. Georgia and South Carolina, sixth driest. All of these areas in yellow, orange, and red below normal precipitation. So you can see the uh, connection between the areas that had a lot of fires and how dry it was in those places. But it wasn't only dry there, it was also very hot there. Four states had their hottest summer on record. In June, I went to Oklahoma City to give a talk about climate change to a meeting of broadcast meteorologists. When I got there, it was 101 degrees in June. It felt hot, but you know, I've been in 101 degree weather before. What I didn't realize was that by the end of the summer, they would regard that as one of the cooler days <laughs> because they had temperatures that topped 110 degrees in Oklahoma on several occasions. One of our uh, Rutgers meteorology students, who's a senior right now, had a summer research internship in Norman, Oklahoma last summer. And uh, you know, when he came back, he was just blown away by how hot it had been. Uh, I was talking to him last night, and he's accepted uh, an offer to attend grad school at the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> And one of the things he said to me is, what's the odds that in the next four years it's going to be as hot as it was when I was there last summer? But uh, you'll notice that that heat was quite extensive. So 117 is warmest. So places that are listed as 116 would have their second warmest summer on record. That includes Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Delaware, here in New Jersey was the third warmest, as I showed you before. So drought and heat often go together, and they did last summer in the area that received these wildfires. Now, what does the science tell us about the relationship between heat and drought and climate change? Observations <laughs> since 1950 show changes in some extreme events, particularly daily temperature extremes and heat waves. So there have been more heat waves. There have been more unusually high daily temperatures like the 105 we had in New Brunswick. Two years in a row we had 105, by the way, because it also happened in the summer of 2010. And this isn't surprising, because if you're making the world warmer, it's going to be easier to break high temperature records than it is low temperature records. So far in 2012, there have been something like 14 times as many high temperature records broken across the country as low temperature records. And if we take a bigger period, because obviously this winter has been unusually warm, if we look at, say, the last 10 years, there's nearly twice as many, as many record highs as record lows. So this is not surprising. And the scientists who studied this problem concluded that it's virtually certain that increases in the frequency of warm daily temperature extremes will occur throughout the 21st century on a global scale. It is very likely, 90 to 100% probability, that heat waves will increase in length, frequency, and or intensity over most land areas. 
Now there's also evidence, but with only medium confidence, not as high as 90 to 100 percent, that droughts will intensify over the coming century in southern Europe and the Mediterranean region, Central Europe, Central North America, Central America, Mexico, Northeast Brazil, and Southern Africa. So heat and drought, when we talk about those kinds of events, there is potentially a connection with climate change. Again, keeping my baseball analogy in mind, that doesn't mean every time there's a drought or a heat wave, we should say this is because of climate change. All of these events have multiple causes, but if we change something in a systematic way to make heat and drought more likely, then we're going to be seeing more of those events. Last spring, we also had some historic tornado outbreaks. Here's a picture of the tornado that hit Joplin, Missouri. Now, you know, most of us, when we see something like this, uh, it, you don't even realize necessarily that that's a tornado because we picture a, a skinny funnel-shaped storm. This storm was so huge that the base of the tornado was more than a half mile across. This is what meteorologists call wedge tornadoes. They're so big. This is an extremely powerful storm. Does anybody know what this building was? Hospital. Yeah, that's the hospital in Joplin, Missouri, that the storm directly hit. Look at these houses across the street here that are just nothing but foundations and debris. Uh, the Joplin storm also hit the high school, but fortunately uh, it was graduation, but they weren't holding the graduation at the high school. They were holding it at a community college that was outside the path of the storm. This storm was very dangerous because it hit on a, a Sunday afternoon. This is not a time when people are usually as in touch with what's going on as they might be if they were at work or at school. So uh, as bad as it was, it probably could have been worse if it had hit uh, an area where large numbers of people were, were located. Now, because last spring was unusual in both the intensity and the number of tornado outbreaks, you'll recall there were big storms that hit the Carolinas around Raleigh in April. Also, uh, Georgia and Alabama, Tuscaloosa was hit very hard during the spring. Questions have been asked, you know, is this an indication of climate change? So what do we know about the relationship between tornadoes and severe thunderstorms and climate change? First of all, we can't really say if they're happening more often. Now this is a quote from the report, and it's, it's got a lot of jargon in it. Data inhomogeneities and inadequacies in monitoring systems. So what does that mean? What that means is that if you're as old as I am, you remember when it was a rare thing to actually see an image of a tornado in action. The first one I remember seeing was kind of a grainy eight millimeter film of a tornado hitting somewhere in Dallas in the 1960s. But the world is different now, right? If there was a tornado out here, I could pull out my phone and capture it on video. So we are much more likely to see and know about storms, tornadoes, severe thunderstorms that happen today than we would have been a long time ago. We have Doppler radar now, which can see the circulations associated with storms forming before they develop. So because of that, it's very hard to determine whether or not there are real trends or whether we're just better able to see these storms. <coughs> this is a much simpler statement. Yes. <laughs> the science is not good enough right now for us to know how these events are going to be affected by climate change. And the like reason my, is... like my broker. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's where they got that statement from. <laughs> that's right. Past performance is no indication <laughs> of it. Yeah, right. The reason is that severe storms require 
a couple of things. When I say severe storms now, I'm talking about tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, not nor'easters. They require a lot of energy being available in the form of instability in the atmosphere. That instability comes from the surface being heated, especially when there's a lot of moisture around. At the same time, the upper atmosphere is relatively cold. And that's why the spring tends to be the tornado season here in North America. Because the sun is strong, and so it's starting to really heat up the ground, but you still have a little bit of the leftover weather patterns from winter because the higher latitudes, the Arctic, is relatively cold at that time of year. The, uh, that aspect of the conditions for severe storms will probably be made more likely uh, by climate change. But another important aspect of the conditions for severe storms is what is called wind shear, vertical wind shear, the difference between the speed of the winds near the surface and the speed of the winds, uh, say, 15, 20, 25,000 feet up. Climate change is expected to weaken the vertical wind shear. So on the one hand, you have conditions becoming more unstable, which would make storms more likely. But on the other hand, you have shear becoming weaker, which would make storms less likely. The future trends are uncertain because we don't know how those two factors are going to balance each other out. Are the upper winds slowing down or the lower winds speeding up? Which way is it? It's more the upper winds slowing down. Okay. Yeah. So another big event from this past year, Hurricane Irene. Here's the track of Irene. Made its first landfall on the Outer Banks as a Category 1 storm. In a way, everyone was fortunate because at a t for a time it looked like it might be a Category 3. When it hit the Carolinas, it crossed the Outer Banks, moved back offshore near Norfolk, came up just off the coast, and made landfall again somewhere around a uh, little egg inlet, uh, skirted the New Jersey coast, made another landfall near Coney Island, uh, western Long Island, early on the morning of August the 28th. Uh, a lot of things happened associated with Hurricane Irene. Here are some radar images showing the very heavy rain that was associated with the storm. Uh, at this point, the storm is down here somewhere. You'll notice there's a lot more rain to the north and west of the storm than there is to the east of the storm. That continued to be the case even as it moved up close to the uh, New Jersey shore. And all this heavy rain out ahead of the storm really became the story in very short order. This is what Irene looked at, looked like along the coast. This is Asbury Park down here. So the surf actually coming up to the boardwalk, hitting the seawall, and uh, splashing across the boardwalk. Uh, it's always good when the photographers use their telephoto lenses to make the guy look like he's standing only a few inches <laughs> from the crashing surf. <laughs> it's uh, impressive enough even without uh, him standing there. Things did happen in terms of wind damage in the interior of New Jersey. Of course, part of the reason for that was with record wet August uh, going into the storm, uh, it made it much easier for trees to be uprooted. And uh, a lot of power problems uh, in the uh, northern part of the state uh, I, and, and actually even down in central New Jersey where I live, I was very thankful that our utilities were underground in our neighborhood because uh, uh, in a big storm like this, if my sump pump starts working, I could forget about the furnace and the water heater and everything else in the, mm -hmm. the basement. I had a, a generator ready to go that my brother lent to me because he's an electrician and uh, I, was, I was ready to turn it on, but fortunately things continue to, to work. But uh, really, the rain 
was a big part of the story over the interior. Here's a map of rainfall amounts. Looking at the scale down here, the dark purple, six inches or more, the lighter blue, eight inches or more. So this was one of the wettest statewide rainfall events on record. And of course, that heavy rain extended all the way up into upstate New York, Vermont, where there was a tremendous flooding. So it's a very, very wet storm. You can see what the flooding did in New Brunswick. Route 18 here, underwater. Uh, some of the areas, this is also Route 18. These are some uh, nice luxury apartments just off of Route 18. You can see the water was higher, judging by the mud on the car. Uh, Manville. A uh, very flood prone area was once again inundated. Millstone. The Millstone River uh, slightly exceeded its level from Hurricane Floyd in 1999. So this really was the record level. Here's the Great Falls again. I always find this aerial picture interesting, you know, folks are just sitting here in their cars in traffic over here while this is going on, you know, a few few hundred feet away. I guess they have a lot of confidence in the engineers that built this. <laughs> and uh, Lincoln Park, Patterson, you know, just tremendous flooding associated with this storm. Here's a, another shot of Fairfield. Uh, looks like a relatively new housing development, but uh, inundated there. Wow. This, uh, you know, if you, you look at this carefully, you can kind of figure out what's happening here. This is probably a small stream or gully that is in a culvert. See the little bridge over here? And the water just undermined the road and was probably dark when this guy was driving along. And of course, out here on 287, the uh, shoulder went into the Rockaway River, I think that is. The reservoir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it just, you can see it took out the guardrail. Uh, this was happening at night, so I think, you know, it's actually quite fortunate that nobody wound up driving into that because it's very, you know, it's, it's basically right out here almost to the travel lanes. So, uh, and DOT, I think, had it repaired in two or three days, which is amazing. You know, it really was amazing. So what do we know about tropical cyclones and heavy rains and their relationship to climate change? So for hurricanes, tropical cyclones are what meteorologists call hurricanes, mainly because in other parts of the world they call them typhoons or cyclones. They're really all the same thing, just different names. There's low confidence in any long-term trends in tropical cyclone activity, and, and that's Partly for the reason I was talking about when it comes to uh, tornadoes. We have better satellites, better surveillance now. It's easier to detect short-lived storms than it used to be. And so we have low confidence in trends, even though you'll sometimes hear people talk about trends in the intensity, frequency, or duration of storms. We're, we really don't have much confidence at this point. In the future, we do expect the wind speeds associated with tropical cyclones to increase. The total number of storms will either decrease or remain essentially unchanged. So what this is happening, what this is saying is maybe there'll be about the same number of storms or even fewer storms, but some of those storms will be more intense. And that comes from the warming of the ocean. 
When it comes to heavy rains, there have been statistically significant trends in the number of heavy precipitation events in some regions. So when we crunch the data and look at the trends and use very good statistical methods to make sure what we're seeing is real, there do seem to be uh, upward trends in heavy precipitation. And we expect that trend to continue as we go into the 21st century that in a warmer world, we're likely to see more of the rainfall concentrated in heavy rain events. And whether or not this will produce floods, this is a long statement. What it basically says is that in large river basins, like the Mississippi, think of something big like that, we can't really say if there have been trends in smaller river basins like the ones in New Jersey, there are indications of trends, but we don't know how much of that is climate and how much of that comes from changes in land use as we've uh, increased the surfaces that are impervious, leading to more runoff. So this is a, a case where we have two things that may be driving things in the direction of more flooding on the kinds of river basins of the size we have here in New Jersey. Okay, now our October snowstorm, or snowtober as some people have coined it. Here's the snowfall map for uh, October 28th and 29th, I think it was. Uh, the areas in the darker blue color, six inches or more in New Jersey, as much as I think uh, 16 inches of snow. And now I live down here, and so we had about four inches. But uh, shoveling my driveway was like shoveling four inches of cement, wet cement. Uh, here is what the satellite image looked like a day later when the skies had cleared. This white is showing you the extent of snow. Notice how well that matches up with the blue areas you're seeing in that map. And this was a very common scene, uh, even in places that if you look here, there probably is, this is probably more like the amount of snow I had in, in my driveway. Uh, but some pictures from places that got a lot more snow. And this was still heavy, wet snow. Now, where did I spend this storm? Now, this is, you, you're maybe going to start to wonder about me after I tell you this story. So I was out playing golf when it was 105 degrees. <laughs> so this day, Rutgers was playing West Virginia in football at Rutgers Stadium. And I was sitting there for four hours. And Rutgers lost, too. It was really a bummer. But uh, I did have a good view of the snow. <laughs> my, my wife decided at halftime that she could see it just as well sitting in the car. <laughs> and so I found her there. And the car was nice and warm when I got back to the car. But on the way home, so she's driving. And she said, well, which way should I go? And I said, pick the roads that don't have any trees over them. <laughs> because that was really the big problem in that, in that storm, was down trees. And they, of course, took power lines with them. Now, we also had other big snows. I promised that I would sneak a week back into 2010. To show the December 2010 blizzard. Uh, this is where you can't distinguish the snow from the sand dunes here on the beach in Seaside Park, New Jersey. Uh, that was an incredibly heavy storm in some places that we don't usually associate with the heaviest snows. Uh, you know, 20, 25, 30 inches in the urban parts of New Jersey down along the coast, but then a very sharp drop off. So, you know, where we're sitting now, it was a a snowstorm that you would take notice of, but it wasn't an outstanding storm. Uh, and out near the Delaware River, 
you know, only a couple of inches of snow. So this had a major impact because think Garden State Parkway, New Jersey Turnpike, all of the other roads in the uh, eastern part of the state. So what can we say about snowstorms and climate change? Well, the report that I showed you before didn't say much about this, but this is actually some work that uh, a PhD student of mine uh, did for his dissertation. And the thing to remember is that if you're not in the mountains and you're not in the Arctic, snowstorms require timing. They need both abundant moisture and below freezing temperatures. So why didn't we have much snow this winter? We had neither. It was dry and it was too warm. But you can get a big snowstorm in the middle of a warm winter if it happens to be cold at just the right time. We had a big snowstorm in February 1983, two feet of snow, lightning and thunder with the snow. Uh, the next day it was in the 40s. A week later the snow was all gone. It just happened to come together just for that one storm. So in most areas that are subject to snowfall, we're again going to see these potentially counteracting effects. An increase in winter precipitation, but a decrease in the fraction of precipitation falling as snow. So what that may mean is that when it does snow, there's the potential for bigger storms. But overall, if you're in an area like New Jersey where the winter temperatures are closer to freezing, uh, you may also see less snowstorms, more winters like the one we've just seen. But these trends are going to be very slow to emerge. In climate science, we use, we borrow terminology from electrical engineering and talk about the year-to-year -year fluctuations as noise. Now that sounds kind of dismissive because what we're really talking about is weather that has an important impact on our lives. But it's noise in the sense that it's this kind of unpredictable year-to-year -year fluctuation in weather that makes it harder for us to see what the climate is doing. So snowfall is not going to be a reliable indicator of climate change because it varies too much from year to year. Next winter could be a snowy winter. It's often just a matter of timing. 